Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Conscious Workspace inside Tempe, Arizona, where we help build businesses and connect you with the right people. I'm Karen Nowicki, and I am very excited about our conversation today. It feels like it's a long-awaited conversation, but really the opportunity just arose <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. I am looking forward to having you meet my friend Derek Maines, the president of Fat Scooters. Welcome to the studio. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait. I mean, the, the energy you and I created just I know, from right? the, the door to here. I, we should have left the recording on. Is palatable. <laughs> right. Yes. I, and I, I said, should we be recording right now? Because right. we got caught up. Uh, Derek, you and I have met through, I want to say conscious capitalism first, but I don't know if that's probably, correct. Probably. Uh, but for sure, through our friend, Andrew. Andrew Kolikoff, of course. Yes. Of so course. shout out to Andrew. Andrew right. Shout out to Andrew. And um, I jokingly said in the intro that uh, we should have done this a long time ago. It feels like yeah. the opportunity has been there. Uh, but you guys have been up to such great things. Yeah. And I think we have Robin to thank from your team who reached Absolutely. out. Yeah. So tell us who is Fat oh, Scooters? Fat Scooters started here in, originally started in Tempe about three years ago. Uh, I think our, our three year anniversary was in June. We started really based upon this uh, idea of, of being able to get around your neighborhood without driving a car, but being too lazy to <laughs> ride a bicycle. A couple of friends. Peter Johnson, who's our CEO, uh, Bo Ralphs and Dan Hankins, who are also friends of Peter's. They, uh, Dan had bought a couple of these um, fat tire looking scooters online. He brought them to his house, had Peter and Bo over for a barbecue. They rode these things around. I think they said within an hour, they got stopped 12 times by people that were like, hey, what are those? Where do we buy them? By the time they got back home uh, to Dan's place, they realized there was a potential business opportunity here. The challenge was, is that when they really looked at what Dan had bought, it wasn't very high quality. It was really a toy. It was you know, something that you find on the internet and you're like, that looks cool. You use it for a week and you say, wow, this is a lot of fun. And then it just stops working. And then and you put it out in the alley behind your house and, and it's gone two weeks later. This was, it was really a disposable type unit, but it had this big fat tire on it. And they felt like based upon that ride around the neighborhood that maybe there was an opportunity. So they got on a plane, they flew to China. They both had been business, all of these guys have been businessmen here in the Valley for years, very successful. They had people on the ground in China that worked for them, went to China, sat down with their people and they said, we wanna build our own version, but we don't want it to be a toy. They went out, they interviewed factories. They found a factory that uh, actually didn't laugh at them because most of them were like, this is gonna be too expensive. Why would, and nobody's gonna buy these. These are gonna be, you know, everybody wants to go cheap. And they were like, we're not trying to go cheap. We're trying to go high quality. So they imported about 400 of these. Before they arrived, all of them were sold out. They ordered another 600. Before those arrived, all of them were sold out. At that point, uh, we were in a 2,000 square foot uh, building in Phoenix. And that's when I really started getting involved. I had some other business ventures with these guys and they were like, we might be onto something. So we were in that 2,000 square feet building for 30 days. We outgrew it. We moved into a 5,000 square foot building. 60 days later, we had outgrown that. Moved into 14,000 feet, then expanded over the last two years into 31,000 feet. And then uh, just a month ago this weekend, moved into a 48,000 square foot manufacturing facility right down the street right here off Broadway and 40th Street. So we're like neighbors. Yes. Uh, but it's been really an amazing journey. Three years. Three years, and we've grown significantly. I mean, even just in the last year, last September, we had 15 full-time employees. I think we had 63 today and probably could hire 60 more pretty quickly. Uh, we were just struggling. The job market even with COVID, interestingly, is extremely tight, uh, particularly in the fabricator warehouse where we have a lot of that type of production work. There's just not a lot of people out there looking for those jobs right now. The unemployment rate is way too, you're getting paid much more to sit at home and do nothing than you are to go work huh? for a $20 an hour job. And that's been a big challenge. And I know a lot of other manufacturing companies here in Arizona have been saying the same thing. It's like, we need people. We're going to have to start relocating them from someplace else because there's not enough people here in Arizona that are 
that are out looking right now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's been really, you know, explosive growth. No kidding. So fill in the gap for me. Maybe I, I misunderstood. Yep. They they went to a chi- to yep. China before you came on board, and and that's where the design was created, yep. and and it originally manufactured. Absolutely. So 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 now we're here. Which yes. which hooray. <laughs> yes. So how that worked is. The design was was created by us. The entire supply chain in Asia was controlled by us, and we hired a factory to do the assembly in China. Over the last three years, we've learned that uh, you have to do still, even if the even if you get a finished good from uh, the Chinese mainland, forty percent of the work still happens here because the quality just doesn't meet the expectations that we have. There's a lot of cost-cutting measures that get put into place, as well as a lot of accessories. Our average scooter, when we started selling them three years ago, was was $1,500. Our average scooter now is over $4,000. $1,500 in accessories is the average add-on to a scooter. And I have scooters that we're going to show on our TV show this fall that start at $25,000. So the accessory piece became really, really big for us. So we were already doing a considerable amount of the fabrication on this end. All of the accessories, uh, we make these things into golf carts. We have surfboard carriers. We have baskets. All of those things are manufactured here in Arizona and being added on to those units. And what we discovered about a year ago was that on average, we were spending about six and a half hours in bringing the Chinese product up to our quality specifications. But if we were to build the product from parts, we could build it in four hours. So we actually put more labor more work and more American parts into the vehicle is actually becomes less expensive from a labor perspective to actually do the work here in the U.S. and Mexico. So we've been working for the last year to relocate our supply chain. Still not all here. It's going to take time. It's a long process, particularly when the global supply chain does not exist in the U.S. It's been gone for over 20 years. You know, go, go try to find a bolt manufactured in Arizona or in the U.S. Very difficult to do. Or in some in elements like electronic components, there's electronic components I can buy in Asia for five dollars and Mexico for twenty, hundred and sixty here. So you've gotta you gotta figure out what's the sort of blend between the price consciousness of your consumer, their flexibility and understanding American made versus you know made overseas. But for the most part, we are now hardcore in this process of relocating as much as is humanly possible to about a 300-mile radius of this location. With the administration's change with a lot of the trade policies with Mexico now, there's incredible opportunities right now in manufacturing in Mexico where some instances you can manufacture in Mexico and still be considered American-made based upon some of these new trade agreements. So there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and there's a lot of regulation around that, right? It's not just go produce it in Mexico and say it's it's not the way it's made. It's it's very particular with what elements can come from there and does the design and engineering. And there's a, there's a lot to it, but we're in that process right now. And we hope this time next year, we'll be able to say made in America, but we're getting closer every single day. We're putting more and more American components in, more things that we're designing and engineering ourselves. And really, we're taking this, making this transition from being a a company that was designing and and making a scooter to becoming an electric vehicle manufacturer. You know, we have a lot of IP now around battery technology and our motor. So that's all starting to come into the supply chain right now. And it's it's pretty exciting where we're going. No kidding. So I want to, you mentioned TV show. We're going to go there in a second, but fill another gap for me. You mentioned that you worked with these guys before. Mm -hmm. And at some point they're like, we're really onto something. So how do you land in in a president position? (sighs) Yeah. Yeah, I got tricked. (laughs) Peter, if you're listening. Uh, No, what happened interestingly is I, uh, my last company, I've I've been around the Valley for uh, 18 years now, and I've been involved in a lot of companies. My last company was a was a, a combination of a number of organizations that I'd been involved with over about a six or seven year period. We ended up doing a merger transaction where we all merged into one organization and then did a NASDAQ listing. And we did that in 2014. Since that time, I have been focused mostly on consulting and writing books. So I've written a number of different books about lean manufacturing, about growing companies, and in that last sort of five years, I was really loving this, right? I was making a lot of money doing it. I was really enjoying it. I was controlling my schedule, but I worked from home. So my good friend, Peter Johnson, again, if you're listening, Peter, uh, you know the story. Uh, he, 
they opened an office right down the street from me. So he's like, hey, do you want an office? You know, like you can come and maybe give us some hang. free <laughs> advice and you can have a free office space. Uh, the office never materialized. It is actually a joke uh, at even with our production team. For three years, I've never had an office to the point every time an office is assigned to me, if I go out of town and come back, there's like somebody else in there because we grow so fast. <laughs> so it's become this sort of running joke that Derek never gets an office. So I got lured in with this, this, hey, do you want a space that you can hang out? And then I started doing a little consulting and then it became a little more and a little more. And the next thing you know, back in December, it was like, you know what? I live here anyways. I might as well just move in my stuff. So yeah, we made it really official in December and I came on board as president. And, um, you know, uh, it's exciting. I mean, we've, we've seen considerable growth. I think it was a smart move for me to come into a strategic role, you know, not knowing that COVID was going to happen, but uh, being able to be part of that executive team that helped us navigate that was really important, I think, to the company. And it's, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, uh, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, the results are there and uh, I think it was a good move for me and it was a good move for the company. For sure. So I'm trying to picture these fat scooters. I've yes. seen I've seen them. But yeah. how would you describe them? I mean, fat tires are just basically a scooter with fat tires so that they're yeah. comfortable. The seat is wider as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, it, we, we consider this a neighborhood electric vehicle. Like we're even trying to get away from the scooter term anymore, even though the company's named that, because we do sidecars now. We, we're, we're getting into a lot of different things where you really have to think of this thing as a stand up or sit down. It's 160 pounds. This is not a lime or bird scooter. This is a vehicle, right? Uh, our commercial units have a two year warranty. I mean, these are used in commercial applications and agriculture and at golf courses and resorts and, uh, you know, police use them. So I mean, this is an actual vehicle. It's not, it's not your go on uh, online and buy a $500 unit. This is not the game that we're From in. From conception yeah. to three years. Yes. It's amazing. It really is. It's, <laughs> it seems like, uh, and people always say that, you know, an overnight success takes about 10 years. I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that we'd been successful before. Yes. We'd also been wildly failed at being entrepreneurs before. So we could identify certain patterns and we... We did some things very different, I think, in this company than any other company I've ever been in. And that has been, we have allowed the demand to far exceed the supply for three full years. Mm -hmm. Last year, we estimate that we walked away from about 75%, about $2 million yet last year we walked away from. We just didn't place orders for. People wanted the product and we just said, sorry, can't help you. Mm -hmm. Last month, we walked away from probably $400,000 in orders. We just don't have enough supply to meet the demand. That's been really interesting. Many times as an entrepreneur, you build a business and then you, you know, you're like the field of dreams. You build it and then you hope that they show up. This is the exact opposite. We've always had far more demand for the product than we have the ability to produce that product. And regardless of how fast we've scaled, how large we've grown, how many people we hire, it, it just seems like sales are, once again, we're like, dang it, now what are we going to do? You know, it, it, but, but that's a good problem to have. But it's also, I think, because we're a little gun shy, we've, we've failed and succeeded before. So we know that truly market demand is what dictates if you're going to be a success or not. So we've allowed that market demand to really push the business. And it's uh, both a good and a bad thing. I mean, it can be frustrating to walk away from dollars on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but I think it's really helped us cement this position in the market. It's given us this top brand sort of perspective, and it's helped us to build a brand that now we can really start to scale. We know that there's an opportunity. We think we've identified how large the opportunity is, and now it's just a matter of capitalizing the organization, hiring the right people to scale that up to, you know, we want to build a billion dollar brand. I mean, I've never built a billion dollar brand before. I've been involved in, I've been involved in ones that have gotten to like the 600 range, never done a billion. I want to do a billion dollar one. So I'll just make the Done. proclamation right now. That's where we're going with this. <laughs> good, thing. good. Another electric vehicle manufacturer in Arizona with a billion dollar valuation. Electrical manufacturer. Electric vehicle manufacturer. I mean, we really are an electric vehicle manufacturer. I did. If okay. You think about it, because this is all electric. And we've, we've, that's the reason that to move the manufacturing here is because now we have a lot more control of our design. We have a lot more control of the intellectual property we put into the, or into the, uh, into the, the scooter. And we even then can license some of that technology even to competitors. And we, we've been looking at certain things that we think we'll be able to license out to other people in the electric vehicle industry in the future. That's where we want to go is being an electric vehicle manufacturer. You got Nicola right here. 
right? You got yep. fat scooters right there. We're, I think we figured it out the other day, we're a, uh, we're a four mile uh, drive from, uh, you know, one of the biggest electric vehicle manufacturers in the world, or hopefully will be. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So brilliant. Really. Like yeah. it's just nothing short of brilliant. Well, that's just, I'm that smart. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Forget everybody else. This no, is all about Derek. Yeah, it was all no, me, love, of course. Well, but, but that's why they brought you on, right? This experience yeah. and, and not only the experience and the wisdom um, and this, this lean, you know, do it lean, sure. yeah. but also the enthusiasm, and the passion. There's never a time that I haven't been around you, which isn't very often, but yeah. a handful of times that you just don't exude. I have no idea what you're talking Excitement about. Yeah. And, and passion, and, yeah. I, and I love it. So you mentioned the TV show. Yes. How did that happen? Like, yeah. really, how do we go from you know, a scooter company now having a TV show that doesn't even make sense? Yeah, so one of the things, and you can go on our Instagram or our website, that you'll see is we have always, since our inception, had an extremely high level of entertainers and athletes that have been customers. A lot of that has to do with the original team, Peter swam in the Olympics in 2000. Bo played for U of A. Uh, he was on. He was, you know, a mentor to a lot of great uh, NFL players. Drew, who's another member of our team, was Wayne Gretzky's uh, merchandise agent for a long time. Folks like Lindsay, uh, who's on my team, uh, she she pretty much knows every MLB and NHL and NBA player out there. We had a core group of people that knew a lot of people. So when we first went out into the marketplace, a lot of those original customers were folks like Bill Murray. So we, we got this incredible brand awareness right out of the gate because of that. And that was really helpful, I think, in helping to build and establish this brand and grow it in a specific direction. And still to this day, right, everybody's blowing me up on Instagram this week. If you haven't seen the Wild Hogs stuff yet, but the Arizona Cardinals this weekend did a huge feature on their YouTube channel on how many of their players have fat scooters. They have their own little biker gang. They have fat scooter parking at the stadium. I mean, it's a big thing. These guys hang out and ride all the time together. And it's become such a big thing that they're the offensive line of the Cardinals is now known as the Wild Hogs. So awesome. They're, they're known for their fat scooters. So that's been super helpful, I think, in the brand and helping us grow very, very quickly and getting that um, sort of influencer piece of the business, I think, in place. But the great part about that is we don't give away scooters for free. Uh, it's one of the questions I get from investors all the time. They'll say, well, you know, what do you pay these people to be influencers? And I say, we don't pay them to be influencers. They're part of our culture. They're part of our customer base. That started because of that, long story short, because of that, over the course of the last three years, we have heard from multiple different producers that were like, hey, you got this sort of cake boss, Orange County choppers yes. kind of thing going, you know, you get... I don't think you were ever at our old office, but we had a 2,000 square foot bar in our office that was fully stocked and, and supplied by many of the brands that we work with, which a lot of them are liquor brands. We're installing an 8,000 square foot entertainment space in our new office with a full stage, a 10 foot disco ball. It's a party. Uh, it is a party. We have a 400 foot racetrack out back. I mean, we're we're doing it up. So So all of those little elements created this environment where television producers were calling us and saying, this could be something. What then occurred is the night there was a secret sauce event. We did one here before. The last secret sauce event, which was in March, that night I'm standing at the bar and the news comes across that the NBA had canceled the season. And at that point, we had 100 events scheduled for this year. Everything from the Masters to Pebble Beach to you name it, we were involved in it. All sorts of, uh, we were involved in the NFL draft. We were going to be at the NFL Hall of Fame ceremony. We had all of these crazy things going on. And overnight, we knew every one of those things was going to be done. So what we did is that night, we got together as a team and we said, what are the opportunities that COVID creates? And we immediately realized that we were going to have to probably reduce our headcount because we had a lot of events people. We knew that that was something we were going to have to do. We also knew that based upon everybody tells you after a recession, that the smartest brands uh, double their advertising during a recession. So we quadrupled our advertising that night. And the next thing we did was we called a, a young lady here in town named Kelly Salloway, very well-known executive producer, has produced a lot of shows for Motor Trend and Discovery, called her up and I said, what do you, do you, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And she's like, yeah, Hollywood's not going to have any new content for a year because right. everything's going to shut down. And I said, can you get a camera crew here tomorrow to shoot a sizzle reel? And 7 a.m., the, the next morning, the camera crew showed up. 
we shot a four hour sizzle. We shot for four hours. We got about a three minute sizzle reel and we hired a broker and started shopping the show. So I'm going to let you get a word in edgewise in case you have a question and then I can tell you the rest. No, keep, I, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm on the edge yep. of my seat, literally. All right, good, well, good, good. Me too. I'm about ready to fall off. So we created this little sizzle reel. We, we just pieced together some stories of, of entertainers and things that we had worked with. We hired a broker because I'm a big fan of coming from a consulting background. I think if you don't have consultants, if you don't have experts that are advising you, um, you're probably not very bright. So I'm always a big fan of hiring people. I don't care what they cost. If somebody's $500 an hour, but they can give me $50,000 an hour in advice, I'm going to pay them all day long. So instead of going out and trying to figure out how to do this on our own, we knew that there was a guy here in town that had brokered a dozen or more shows, called him up. He also is sitting there at his desk, wringing his hands going, what am I going to do? I make money off brokering shows. There's not going to be any more shows for a while. Called him up talk to him. He said, look, there's never going to be a time like this to pitch a TV show. You will get the best deal you ever got in your life right now because every network is terrified. He started making phone calls. We engaged him. He started making phone calls. Within about three weeks, we had three networks that had made offers for the show. We decided uh, to go with a network called Crackle, which you probably, you may have heard of or may, may have not heard of. Crackle is owned by Sony Entertainment. It's the third largest streaming platform in the world or in the in the universe, I guess, of uh, North American streaming platforms. So you've got like the Netflix, the Amazon, and then Crackle. Crackle had never really done a lot of its own programming. It had mostly syndicated other programming. They had just started into this idea of doing their own programming. And we sat down with them. They just loved the idea. They thought it was a great show. They were pretty much like, don't negotiate with anybody else anymore. We want this show. We're going to make it it work. Yeah. Yeah. And we got just an incredible deal with them. Um, we decided to cover all of the costs of the show ourselves. And we did that intentionally because we also knew that, thinking about it, if the, if the networks weren't going to have new programming, that means viewership is going to go down. That meant their revenues were going to go down. So they wouldn't have money to, to buy new shows. So we came in and said, we're going to provide you a show with everything included. All we're asking from you is distributions and licensing, all those kind of things, which made the, the conversation much easier and allowed us to maintain full control of the show. All the product placement, all the stories, everything are written right in our office. Um, really? All the merchandise, we own 100% of all of our merchandise rights. We, Again, this is not a deal you would have got any other time. So, And also, in addition to that, you have to think all of the people in Hollywood who were working for a really great rate all got unemployed very quickly. And, and as soon as you say you're having a TV show, you get the best talent at a lower rate because they're not working. So we got an incredible director. I mean, he's Everything he produces, I feel like he's like the Midas touch. I mean, he's done uh, Netflix documentaries with Robert Downey Jr. He was the director of Sesame Street for a few years. So he's just a great, like, storyteller. He tells it with pictures. So we're, we're super excited about it. The show's called Riding Fat, and um, it's in production. I mean, literally, I left the lot to come over here to do this. Have to go back, change clothes. You have to keep, when you do a TV show, you have to keep track of everything you wore. Oh, right? sure. Because I, you, yep. you don't think about the fact that it's like, wait, is this scene connected? It's not shot in order, trust me. And right? it's like, they're like, you're going to shoot this. I'm like, what's this for? They're like, uh, we don't know yet, but just do it. So, but that's, that's the long story, short, I guess, or the Move short story. over long. Kardashians. Yeah, Hello, riding fast. Riding fast. Did you see Kardashians? They're done with their show. Oh, really? Um, I'm yeah. so and I, pleased. I, I, know, I don't <laughs> yeah. follow them. I, yeah. I just happen to see lots yeah. of people are commenting, but there you go. Now we've got this opportunity Absolutely. for riding fat and, yeah. and the momentum and the excitement that you have from the people we all watch, the sure. athletes, yeah. the actors, the celebrities out there, they they really have lend a, lend a hand in the they creation have. of this show. They really have. And that's been the exciting part. You know, I think not having a lot of other things to do. <laughs> We've had some great folks that are appearing in the show this season. And it is, it's a shortened season. It's a six-episode season because we need to get it done so we can get it on the air. Our hope is is that we'll just continue on and start shooting in October again for season two. But we've got great folks like Dominique Wilkins, who's the legendary, you know, Hawks player that, I mean, one of the greatest basketball players of all time. I'm playing one-on-one with him in his backyard. I think now we're turning it to three-on-one because I told him yesterday, I'm like, dude, you you are going to destroy me. (laughs) So can I bring some backup, right? Can I like recruit some? And he's like, yeah, yeah, do what you got to do. But I mean, I guess... You know, he's that Michael Jordan era, so he's probably, you know, I would think in his 50s. 
and I, and I guess he can still dunk. So I'm excited about that. Michael Waltrip, we're going to do a race with Michael Waltrip, uh, the NASCAR legend on scooters. Uh, we've got a couple of other like top level entertainer entertainers. One just, I think this week he just broke a billion views on one of his videos. So we've got some really cool folks. We've also got some folks that you might not know as a household name, but have become really sort of impressive in what they've done. We've got a, a group called the Good Good Group. They are six guys from Dallas, Texas, that pretty much every trick shot you've ever seen for you golf on YouTube. That's them. Oh, I've seen them. I mean, they've had like 25 million views. So they're coming out for a couple of days and we're going to do a bunch of trick shot stuff with them and travel all around the valley and do some really cool things. So we just have some great folks that are going to be in this first uh, first season, as well as a lot of local brands. I mean, we've, we, we try to be as local as we possibly can. The folks over at Rockford Fosgate, we're doing an episode with them. We did an amazing episode that's already almost all done with Dixon Apparel, which is one of the hottest brands here in Arizona right now. It's been really cool. Gila River Casinos has done some cool stuff with us. We shot some stuff there the other day. So it's been really interesting to see how the business community and the big brands in the Valley, even the bigger brands in the Valley, like Henkel, which was here for years, they're doing stuff with us on the show. Their agency reached out to us and we're like, hey, this is a cool opportunity. Can we insert some of our products? Can we, can we, get, can we work with you to help produce this show so that it highlights all of the cool sort of entrepreneurial things that are happening here? And that's exactly what I'm hearing, the yeah. thread through fun and community and win, win, win all the way around. Absolutely. Like that's clearly what's going on. To that point, one of the things that we said when we've been pitched shows in the past, the question from the network was always conflict. What's the conflict? And we never wanted to do a conflict show. Because that's what sells, right? I mean, traditionally, yeah. it's like, yeah, okay, got it. There's got to be a fight between somebody. It's like, who hates who? And we just said, that's not our culture. It's not who we are. So we're not going to do that. Well done. So I think if it wasn't for COVID, we probably could have never got that opportunity to do a show on because our own Because COVID's terms. the conflict. Exactly. Right. I mean, it is the conflict in a lot of senses. But I think on top of that, we, we, we pitched the show as it's us against the world, right? This is a company that is that. still a startup in a lot of senses. It's still a startup. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, I run all the finances for the, for the company. It's, trust me, it's, it's every day. It's, it's, gruel it's not like we're just printing cash, right? I mean, growth is the most expensive thing you'll ever do in a business. And uh, cash flow is always extremely tight. You know, it's like when we got this opportunity to do the show and we were going to pay for it, my board was like, wait a second, are you kidding? We're going to pay for it. And then they, then they thought about it and they said, you know what? This could be a billion dollar opportunity. We don't know. We don't have any idea. I mean, Crackle's audience is over 25 million monthly people that watch it. We're front page for six months. It's like, what benefit does 100 million or 200 million people seeing you give you? It could be huge. It might be nothing. They might look at me and go, that dude's freaking ugly. We don't want anything to do with him. But, but maybe, maybe we find this audience that, that changes the business into a lot of merchandise sales. I mean, you look at other TV shows, they don't make money on the show. They make money on the merchandise. <laughs> you know, everybody wants that T-shirt that you wore. Everybody wants this cool Dixon shirt that I'm wearing today on set. And, and that's where the money really is made. So we just had to look at it and say, look, for the cost, the, oppor the, the opportunity versus the cost, we have to go for it and just well, and see maybe what happens. Maybe a silly example. Sorry for interrupting. No. But I'm thinking about Shark Tank. All those entrepreneurs and inventors who show up on Shark Tank, they most of them know that even if they don't land that deal, that exposure Absolutely. is gold. Absolutely. And, we, and our agreement's for five years. So for the next five years, this show is in distribution all over the country and then all over the world. What does that do for your brand? We just don't know. Well, and I know? love that that... With that commitment, as a team, you are, are already designed this way that you're looking for that next thing Absolutely. and being very careful and strategic about it. But having that as well as kind of the the boost or the lift to say, we got to stay original. We got to yeah. stay ahead of the pack. How can we continue to influence and, and show up in such a big way in manufacturing and electrical yeah. vehicles yeah. and Arizona specific, all that? It's yeah. just the whole package. It really is. And, and we, we've been very, you know, I'm, I've been really helping out a lot in the scripts of the show and the, and the locations. And I was adamant that when we show Arizona, we can't just show desert. Thank you. So we shot a whole episode at Pine Canyon Country Club this last weekend in Flagstaff. Unfortunately, where I live in Pine, Arizona, outside of Payson, we were trying to shoot something up there. We're not going to get it on the schedule. But next season, we're planning on shooting an episode there. We want to show people that Arizona is not just a desert. I mean, I hear this a lot from Californians. They're like, I don't want to move there because it's a desert. I'm like, 
do you realize the biggest pine forest in the world is here? You can go skiing here. There's lakes all over the place. Everybody is, has boats. I mean, it's completely different than what most people think. This is really important. Uh, do you, you and Steve Zylstra know each other through Arizona Tech Council? I don't think so. Oh, gosh. I need to make that introduction. <clears throat> so Steve and I do the AZ Tech Council show here, and yeah. it's called AZ Tech Cast. And the last several conversations we've had have been around how important, obviously, tech is bringing those large companies in. And it's not always Metro Phoenix, right? No. Tucson, all the opportunities for aerospace and, and yeah. all the things, you know, testing that go on out there um, and with Local First and Thomas Barr yeah. and, and Kimber's work, sure. how important we are as a collective state. Yeah. So I would love to make that introduction because yeah, the way that you're thinking and the way in which you guys are representing all of us here in Arizona, yeah. thank you very much, yeah. uh, is it speaks volumes about, again, who you guys are, yeah. your allegiance to the state yeah. and also our growing economy. Uh, you know, just to that point on Sunday or Monday, we uh, we shot downtown Phoenix and I'm an East Valley guy. I have a house in Pine, Arizona. I don't go a lot downtown, but I am friends with Kimber. I'm friends with Thomas. I know all the cool things that are happening down there. And one of the other things that we did when COVID happened was we we had a new product that we were launching on April 1st called The Fleet. And it was specifically designed for food delivery. And our target market for that was Postmates, Uber Eats, all these big guys. We, we designed this unit so that it's allowed in the bike lane, but it can go up to 70 miles on a charge. So it's like an e-bike, but it's a lot more stable. I mean, you can put, it has a sushi bag that stays cold. It has everything you can imagine for pizza delivery or anything. We had all of these units sitting in our warehouse. And, and as soon as COVID hit, everybody started canceling all these meetings. You know, all, all of the big delivery companies are like, hey, give us a call after the pandemic. And we're like, what are we going to do with all this inventory? So one of the things that we made a conscious decision to do was we uh, we reached out to 12 local restaurants that we frequent all the time. And we said, we've got units here. We're putting your brands on them and we're dropping them off. And you can have them. And our objective is to keep you going through COVID, right? To make sure that when, when, you, when you're shut down, you can still do delivery. And if you don't have a delivery infrastructure, you're screwed. And if you call Uber, I don't know if anybody knows, but it, but I don't like to use the big guys for delivery because they take 30%. So think about that. If I'm a restaurant and my margins are 25%, every time you order from me and use one of those delivery services, I, as a restaurant, lose money. So a third of that ticket goes to that company. So we, we drop these scooters off at places like the Chestnut and Postino and the Larry and Kaizen and uh, just all over the valley, we we drop these off. A Miracle Mile uh, Deli, my good friend Josh Garcia over there, we drop these off and we were like, do what you got to do to make this work. And a lot of these folks in, in the last couple months have reached out and been like, you saved me. Like I was done. I thought I was going under, but by, by <laughs> I was able to jump on my scooter and go deliver to somebody's house and go back and cook another meal and deliver to somebody's house. And it kept me going. It kept the bills being paid. It kept food on the table and it kept the restaurant going. So one of, that was one of the stories that I told the director. I'm like, you have to tell this oh, story. Good. You got to go down and you got to. So, so we had the folks over at the Chestnut and we had Josh. Uh, from Miracle Mile, and we had uh, Q and his team down at uh, at the Larry all do really cool segments with us, and that was something that we wanted to talk about. We didn't we didn't want to do it because you know we got a lot of press on it, and and I've actually heard from national TV shows now that want to incorporate that piece into what they do, in, the scooters into what they do because of what they saw. But that wasn't our objective. Our objective was. We like to eat at these places, and we don't want them to go anywhere. And we've got you know, this inventory porch, that right, had this intention. Yeah, yeah. Right, like the porch. I mean, we go to the porch. The porch actually incorporates oh, fat scooters into their decor. Look around. They're in the decor. There's fat scooters hanging up. They're, so we're like, how can we let those guys go under? I mean, mm -hmm. we got to get them help. So we, we had to try to do our part, and, and I'm really glad that that became part of the story as well because it shows what I think the entrepreneurial community in Arizona really is and wants to be, which is – you know, hyper connected to the needs of each other, and if you have the ability to to help, you know, try to do that because a rising tide truly does float all boats, and it's like you can't be a billion dollar brand by yourself. You have to bring others in. You have to bring others along with you. That's why a lot of our vendors are local. I mean, a lot of our fabricators, a lot of our upholstery, all that stuff's here because we might not be able to do everything here, but the things that we can do here, we're gonna do here. So good to hear that. And and it's very consistent with what I hear with most businesses mm -hmm. here at Business Radio X. And I've, I've been doing this for three years as well. I'm not nearly where you guys are at. A whole different ballgame. But 
on occasion, I hear somebody say that Arizona business owners don't play well with others or we've got too many conflict or lack of opportunity to come together between government and our secondary educators and our entrepreneur as well as large enterprises. I disagree. It rarely happens that somebody comes in with that. More people are describing like you're talking this, that how can we lift everybody up? Competition is great. And it needs to be fierce. A lot of times that keeps us motivated and inspired. But to your point earlier, why wouldn't you create and fabricate something so that you can share it and, and with, with somebody else, the competition, and of course, at the right price, right? Absolutely. No, <laughs> but but absolutely. It, creating those win-win opportunities yeah. are, are golden. And clearly, you guys are doing that. We're trying. So how did you become an entrepreneur and yeah. a business owner? Like, take me back. I'm completely unemployable. That's the whole thing. I'm just not, un- I'm, a, I'm an unemployable person. So I had to become an entrepreneur. Uh, no. Help, but, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Because <laughs> I get that. I, I, I have, my wife said, I've gotten one paycheck in I think about 12 years, you know, from a company. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I've always been that way. I think um, it was where I sort of grew up in central Pennsylvania. There wasn't a lot of opportunities. When I was 13 years old, I started a landscaping business. I couldn't drive, so I just had to hire kids that were older than me that had pickup trucks. Pretty much the interview process went, are you 16? Do you have a truck? You're hired. Right? I mean, that was it. So, so you know, I built my first enterprise when I was in, in, my, in my teen years, and it was a lifestyle business, right? I was, I was a uh, musician. I loved to go out, and, and I was a singer, so I used to love to go out and play on the weekends. So I had to find flexibility in my job. So, so running a landscaping business was the best way for me to do that. Um, throughout the years, I've just found that I have a knack for certain things. One of the things I have a knack for is turning companies around. It's been something that I've, since I was, maybe I'm just stupid. I mean, my first really opportunity to do that, I was in my twenties. I, uh, I got a job in sales at a car dealership. I overheard the owner of the car dealership saying that he was going to close the business because it was unprofitable. I, uh, asked him to go to breakfast. I told him, that um, the reason he was unprofitable is because pretty much my manager was stupid and that I was going to fix it for him if he would like me to. And he just sort of laughed and was like, look, the lease ends on the 31st of September. Go for it. If you want to be the boss and you think you can fix this thing, go ahead and fix it. And within 60 days, it was the number one dealership that they had. So, you know, it was, I, I, I think I, I tend to identify where people's strengths are and I put them in those places. But I also am very, very quick to, uh, try to get freeloaders out of the way. And and I think a lot of this, unfortunately, happens as you grow a business is recognizing that the people that you start with rarely, trust me, if you're an entrepreneur, the person you start your business with, the probability that, that you guys will still be together when that business exits is somewhere less than zero. I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. When you hear stories about, oh, two brothers start, that's like a wild exception. But recognizing along the way that, you know, the people that get you to, I always say this, when, when your business is, when, you, when all of the employees of your business can fit in a minivan, there's really no politics. Everything is like easy. You all can go to lunch together. Everybody communicates to the CEO. As soon as you hire that ninth person and, and you can't fit in a standard minivan anymore, all of a sudden, it's, it, there's a lot more rumors that happen. There's a lot more, you don't really have your, you don't really know everything that's happening on a daily basis because you start to create levels inside the organization. Again, that happens at about 50 employees. The people, that first eight in the minivan, when you hit 50 employees, almost without exception, all eight of those people leave. Like either they leave by their own or or you, you know, exit them out. So, you know, I became an entrepreneur because I was really good at doing that. So I'm not a great guy at starting something from scratch. I'm a great guy at helping fix something that has a huge potential but might be stuck or isn't completely sure on how to get to that next level. And that's what I sort of do. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a very type A personality, but I'm extremely logical. I, I had a psycholo- psychological analysis done years ago by a, 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 a private equity group that I was working with. I had a psychologist come in and sort of identify my traits. And they said, you know, logic, you're a 10. Ingenuity, you're a 10. Patience, you're a one. Detail orientation, you're a one. And it was interesting because the psychologist said, because you're so low on these things, you're probably really good at creating systems and processes that cover up for the fact that you're really bad at those things. And at the time, I, I was that. I was a COO. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm the worst guy to be your COO, but I'm actually the best guy because I don't know how to do it without a process. So I think that's been why maybe I've had success, but I've also had failure in that too. Recognizing that things 
do have to work through sort of a logical process, but being willing to pivot when, when needed, as we did with fat scooters, we made a really hard pivot in March and it paid off. You know, you could say some of that's luck. I think some of it's just experience too, of being around enough and not pivoting. I think 2007 was a great example of, I was involved with a number of businesses at that point that sort of laid in the fetal position in the corner and said, let's just wait and see what happens. You know, and then the whole building collapsed around us. But, but you've learned from that. In fact, before we went on air, you said uh, COVID, you knew from a mentor yeah. who'd shared with you that what? Within 20- Biggest opportunities. 24 hours, you have, you have a, you got to move within 24 hours of an opportunity like that. He, my mentor was, a, was a, a billionaire investor from Dallas, Texas, and it's a long story on how we met, but it just was sort of by happenstance. I didn't know who he was. We were involved in a business transaction, and uh, and I did something that really stood out to him, and he just sort of took me under his wing. But, you know, he told me that before the 2008 crash, he was only investing in companies where he could call the CEO and ask them if they had a 510-20 plan. And I was like, okay, what's a 510-20 plan? If you want to know the full story, one of my books talks about it. But a 510-20 plan is a, a written plan that every business has to cut 5% of its expenses by Friday. 10% of its expenses by the end of the month, 20% by the end of the quarter. These are written plans, not only strategically, but tactically. All of your department heads write down, I would cut this person, I would reduce this cost. It's all laid out so that when it hits the fan, You're you pull it out of your office, you pull it out, you hand them out, and you make a decision. Are we doing our five? Are we doing our 10? Are we doing our 20? With fat scooters, we made a decision. We're doing our 20. Right now, we're doing our 20. We did the 20. That gave us a little bit of breathing room. And then we said, okay, now we have some money for a sizzle reel. Now we have some money for marketing. Now we have some money to do these things. And we, you know, maybe we put it all on red right at that point and and spun the wheel. But we couldn't have done that if we hadn't executed on that 5, 10, 20. I I love it because he used to say to me all the time that, you know, if a company is at at 10 million and they're shrinking back to 8 million, um, the easiest way for them to know what they should be spending is to just to look back in their accounting and say, well, to get to 10 million, at some point I had to be 8 million. Well, how many people did I have? What was my products? What were my services? So just looking at business very logically, not using your heart maybe in this process, but just looking at it and saying, what do I have to do to survive? And, uh, and taking that, you know, t- taking that experience and advice and logic and saying, okay, here are the steps, here are the things that I have to do based upon the information that's available to me that I believe will make me a success. That makes sense. It makes great sense. Yeah. Perfect sense. Yeah, love it. Was there ever a time throughout your entrepreneurial journey that you doubted yourself or hit some lows? A few minutes ago, and I don't know what word you said, but you're like, maybe I'm just stupid. Yeah. And, and you know, tongue in cheek. But were there moments? Because there have been mo- those sure. moments for me where I'm like, uh, you know, it all feels right. And then sometimes within a minute, it doesn't because yeah. <laughs> I lose an opportunity sure. or was counting on something happening. It fell through or, or someone leaves my team and yep. I'm like, holy cow, <laughs> I got to do the heavy lifting again. Yeah. And those moments where we personally are <laughs> rolled up in the corner, like yeah. people well, don't often no. think that I have those moments <laughs> in, in business, right? Sure. I, I've shared a lot of it personally, but h- how about you? Like you, cause yeah. you're always this up guy to me, but I, again. Oh yeah. No, I mean, I, I've, uh, the reason I'm so unemployable, I've been fired more times than, you know, I get fired all the time. I mean, I've been fired by boards. I've been fired by CEOs. I get fired all the time. It's, that's okay. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's part of the sort of journey, right? Of recognizing that you really have to take the hits as they come. I'm a big fan. I play a lot of golf and I'm a big fan that, you know, if, if we're going to go play a par three and your objective is to hit a hole in one, you could stand there for a month trying to hit that hole in one. I'm a hack. I might hit it 40 yards and then pull out another club and hit it another 20 yards and another 15. I'm going to get to the hole faster than you, no matter how good you are, because I'm just going to take those little steps. So I don't, I sort of, I think about like time, it goes in one direction. I sort of think about that way with decisions as well. I make decisions and those decisions lead me to other decisions and make me lead me to other decisions. My sort of Religious beliefs are sort of tied into that as well. There's a great uh, Taoist story. We've probably all seen the yin and the yang, right? But the story that goes along with the yin and the yang in Taoism is that there was this farmer that had this, this beautiful thoroughbred horse, and his neighbor came to him and said, you're such a fortunate man to have this horse. And, and, and the farmer said, uh, who's to say what's good or what's bad? Uh, the next day, the horse runs away, and the neighbor comes over and says, I'm so sorry for your loss. And the farmer says, who's to say what's good or what's bad? The next day, the horse comes back, and with it is 10 other stallions that run right into his barn. And his neighbors come over and say, oh, you have such great luck. And he says, 
Who's to say what's good or what's bad? The next day, his son goes out and tries to tame one of those stallions and is thrown off and breaks his leg. And his neighbors come with condolences. And guess what he says? Who's to say what's good or what's bad? bad. The next day, the king marches through his village and is conscripting all the young men to go fight an unwinnable war across the great ocean. And his son can't go because his leg is broken. So who's to say what's good or what's bad? I think so many times in our lives, we think of things as good and evil or this person, you know, I think back to relationships, right? I mean, my first girlfriend, I, I was devastated when she broke up with me. I was like, oh, I thought that was the one. Now I look back, I'm like, thank God. <laughs> so sometimes the worst things that happen to us are the best things. And sometimes the best things that happen to us are the worst things. So I, I try not to judge things based upon if they're good or bad or evil or, or you know, I just, I just respond to them the way that they are. I try to look at those situations very logically and I say, okay, this is the situation. I can't get tied up in it. I can't get upset about it. All I can do is respond to it. And I think that's the sign of a good leader of being able to sort of separate those things out and not looking at something as a panic, but actually saying, okay, COVID is a great example. Everybody was freaking out that night and we were, we sat down and said, okay, biggest opportunity probably in a century. Yeah. Right. And what had, are we going to do around? And had that? you been emotional versus logical, who knows where you would have Who knows? I mean, if we would have sat down now, yes, did we make cuts to our staff that night? Absolutely we did because they were very logical. We had an events team. We had no events. <laughs> well, what are they going to do? So we made that, that organizational cut, but we, we dreamt about it. And we, we sat there that night and we said, what's different with the world? If, if this is a one month thing, then there's a gap of a month of a month in entertainment. If this is a year long thing, if this is like the nineteen, you know, nineteen uh, pandemic, if this is like the nineteen sixty eight pandemic, if it's like any of those, well, guess what? This is going to be a long time that there's going to be a gap, and most people are going to pull back. So the best thing that we can do, listen, we we found that our cost per acquisition was the cheapest it's ever been during COVID. Why? All of our competitors pulled back on their advertising. Nobody was competing for those places anymore. So it was like. Boom, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of businesses that, you know, I, I like to say you were either crushed by COVID or you crushed it. And uh, I mean, I get it. If you're a restaurant, how do you get around that? I mean, there's certain industries that you're just stuck. But for the most part, a lot of the really smart entrepreneurs that I know pivoted in a way that their business is up significantly right now. And that might have been changing their products, changing their prices, changing their strategy, changing their overhead. But they made those changes and they did them not in an emotional way, but in a very logical way of how do I respond to the situation? Mm -hmm. So, I love it. Uh, What is fat-headed? And by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with fat scooters, it's P-H-A-A-T. P-H-A-T, yeah. 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 So what is fat-headed? Oh, fat-headed. I don't even know what that is. Do you not? No. Fat or no, headed. where where is fat headed? Oh, where are oh. we? Yeah, I was gonna say, hey, I guess <laughs> looking, I got a fat I'm looking, no, <laughs> right. So what? where are we headed? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think we've talked a little bit about this. Our we are transitioning our business to be an electric vehicle manufacturer. That's where all the bees exist in the marketplace right now. And when I say bees, I'm talking about billions, right? I mean, that's where billion dollar valuations exist, is in the micro mobility space and in the electric vehicle space. So for us, it's moving the business in that direction and being really open and trying to understand what this television show opportunity means. We don't know yet, right? All we can do, and I will tell you right now, we're, we're bringing on some new marketing people. We're doing a lot of changes inside the organization and, and I'm having them build out business plans for, okay, what happens if we get $20 million in t-shirt orders next year? What happens? How, how do you fulfill those? Who is fulfilling them? What are the vendors? What are the designs? And I'm having them go through all this process because it might, we might not sell a single t-shirt, but we know other successful TV shows have sold nine digits worth of merchandise. So we're like, well, if there's a $100 million opportunity and we aren't prepared for it and we don't have a process flow and we don't have vendors lined up and we aren't ready to go. Now, listen, there could be a sunk cost to that. We might spend thirty or fifty thousand dollars setting that whole thing up, and nobody ever buys a single thing. And that goes back to your point before. It's like, was that a bad decision to do to, to spend that money? Absolutely not. It was the only decision to be prepared for an opportunity that potentially is on the horizon. We, I mean, imagine how foolish we would look if we didn't do that 
And it was him. <laughs> well, and Fat Scooters lends itself to that. Like I can totally see the whole merchandise thing. It just it, it just makes sense. We're right? building a lot of merch. I mean, there's a lot of things through the. I have a number. The great folks at State 48 are doing some. I, I was cool going to ask you. You showed me, right? me something earlier, and yeah. I, I wanted to know if you'd connect. Yeah. Oh, with yeah. Mike. No, Mike. We're we're doing some cool stuff there. You know, when you see the show, there's there's shirts that so I'm wearing good. in the show. That the only way you get that shirt is to go to the Riding Fat website after the episode airs. And it'll be limited edition, and you got to be one of the ones that get it. We're doing that with a number of local artists here. We actually, I don't know if you're familiar with Jay Pierce's work, but oh, sure. Jay is a great friend. Jay actually is the one that connected me with Dominique Wilkins. So he's my ace in the hole for the basketball game in Dominique's backyard because I'm bringing Jay with me. And then Jay tells me, he's like, I'm really not that good at basketball. I'm like, dude, if I thought anybody was great at basketball, it'd be you. Like, he looks the part, he acts the part. Jay is, Justin is just an incredible guy. We've partnered very, very closely with him for this TV show because he is, his brand is so hot right now. Not just the, anybody that knows about Justin which I have a, a cool origin story with him too, but you know, he dresses Samuel L. Jackson. He does a lot of work for Dominique Wilkins. He uh, actually, the mask that I wore in here today, there's 50 of these oh, in sweet. existence. And guess who wore one on Instagram the other day it was LeBron James, right? So Ju Justin's brand is like this right now. And uh, you know, some of that's been through collaboration we've done in the past. I don't want to take any credit off of what he's done as an amazing artist, but you know, when, when the, he was, he was involved in our sizzle reel, I called him up. He was one of the people that has to come in and be in the sizzle reel. So when, when the show got landed, I'm like, dude, we got to do an episode with you. So that's, we're shooting at Justin's house at three 30 today uh, and shooting him painting and, and showing sort of his background and where he comes from. So, you know, to us, we've, we've got to position the opportunity. It's not just the opportunity now. It's how do we position that opportunity to make a profit and to uh, maximize the potential to our shareholders, which is Really what we exist for is, you know, our fiduciary responsibility to the people who invested money in us along the way. And all the stakeholders. All those stakeholders, yeah. absolutely. I mean, that's I'm a very big triple bottom line kind of guy. My if you if you recognize my voice, I was saying earlier, you know, I had a radio show here in town years ago uh, called Your Triple Bottom Line. And that's what we talked about. We talked about how do we how do we blend people, planet, and profits together. And my background in history, a lot of it came from sustainability. Um, I've consulted with ExxonMobil, Walmart, Monsanto. Can you believe it? Somebody actually introduced me at a conference one time and said, Derek is the only sustainability consultant that's consulted for three of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, and I was like, wow, okay, that was, that was a great introduction. But, um, you know, that sustainability background, that's why I love the electric vehicle space, right? I love this electric vehicle space because it is a very, it's where we're going. I mean, there's no doubt about it now that that's where we're going. And, uh, you know, being a part of it in a in a segment and category that's not really heavily addressed by the large automobile manufacturers right now is an exciting opportunity. So two more connections and introductions, yeah. if not already. A to Z Manufacturing Magazine. Ah, I don't okay, got to make that connection. And Dory Morales, Green of Living. Of course, I okay. Dory. I, I, yeah, I Dory, figure you knew Dory. Dory and I go way back. I was on the board of uh, of the magazine years ago when it first got started. She, and, she's uh, a dear and, she and, and, also, and also brilliant. Yeah, yeah she's very Love smart. it. Okay, yeah. so fun. We're yeah. almost at the top of the hour. Perfect. Tell us where we can learn more uh, sure. about Fat Scooters Absolutely. and uh, and. When the um, so you are actually in the the space yeah. just down the road, yeah, a bit. we're right down the street. And you said throughout COVID, you never we never shut down. Yeah. I, and and we were we were labeled a essential business because of our participation in the golf industry. Um, we did a ton of work in the golf industry around single rider. Um, being that we make a single rider golf cart, we sold out very very quickly and struggled to keep up with the demand for manufacturing. When COVID hit and golf was labeled an essential business. Golf and outdoor sporting goods were labeled essential businesses in Arizona. So we were able to keep our manufacturing. We were very, very cautious. We did certain things like we had certain sections of the building that were sort of cordoned off that nobody from another section could go into that section. We took all of our administration, uh, marketing and sales team and put them at home and put them on Zoom. So we kept a very limited operation, but we were, you know, we were successful in doing that. So we've, we've maintained throughout that whole thing and we've incorporated a lot of that into what we do now today and being safe still with COVID, a lot of testing and those kind of things. But um, yeah, you can find out about us at fatscooters.com. That's our main website, P-H-A-T. And then Riding Fat, the best thing to do right now is to follow us on Instagram. The Riding Fat uh, Instagram account has all the behind the scenes footage. So there's probably 25 photos a day and videos a day of all of the production that's happening. And, and a full TV crew is, not, is 16 people. 
I mean, it's, yeah, we're going to Justin's house today. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, you understand there's going to be 16 people in your living room. So it can be pretty uh, overwhelming, but I'd love for you to follow the journey and check it out on uh, Instagram. And uh, hopefully uh, once COVID lifts, we'll do a huge party at Fat and everybody can come and At least out. one party. At least. If I know you, you're, you're hosting a variety of parties. I only do two parties. to three a week. <laughs> only two to yeah, three a week. Exactly. How does your wife keep up with you? I know. Well, she just comes to all the parties. So. <laughs> Easy. Done. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> I love it. Derek, this has been a blast. Yeah, I sure you. appreciate uh, you sharing your story, your success, and uh, your background. How can, are your books available still? Yeah, they're on Amazon. Just Google me, Derek Maines, and... They are all on, I think I've got three on Amazon right now. Yeah, so. all around management and yep. being lean, yeah. sustainability. Yeah, and they're, they're fictional books. The two, the two most important ones are, are fictional books that Fun. I wrote intentionally as fictional stories. But to um, teach? Yes. So it teaches the methodology that I've used in management over my career, the lean methodology, as well as the people management method. And I originally wrote the books as sort of like, okay, step one, two, three, four, five. And I'm like, this is really boring. I'm more of a storyteller, so I decided to just create fictional characters and tell their story, their journey of management and success and failure in business. We have a, I've read a handful of those kinds of books before, yeah. and I am not much of a reader, so yeah. it, that helps me, me too. land in the knowledge and the wisdom of. I, of I those always lessons. say my favorite book is a book called The Clippership Strategy, and it's essentially letters between an uncle and his his nephew that just graduated college, and it's. I learn more from that, but I still read that book probably once a year because it's yeah. so good. So I try to use that same sort of thing of a mentor to mentee, trying to explain to them how to deal with certain situations. And I think it worked. I mean, oh, for sure. Yeah, it did well on Amazon. Who so. Stole My Cheese is the one that, that I think yeah, of, but there's one book. other similar to that. I know there's a, um, there's a bunch, but... Yeah, there's a couple comic books. Too. I, there's somebody recently a sent fish me a or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the, the catch books. Yes. Uh, yeah, that was yes. my old business partner, uh, Cindy Lauren, that wrote those. Yeah. That, oh. So we actually created a lot of our content together for so years good. because she wrote that book. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. Great. Nice. Again, you've uh, just had an opportunity to hear from Derek Maines, president of Fat Scooters right here in Arizona. And uh, do catch them on uh, Instagram mainly. Yeah, I guess that's a uh, place to go. Probably. That, you'll find our YouTube channel and everything from yeah, that. So, yeah. yeah, and then look forward to uh, the premiere coming up in... The week before Christmas. So we'll have a date coming out here real soon. So we'll have a premiere episode that'll launch that week. And then all the streaming episodes will come out in January. And the name of the show again. Riding Fat. Right, I love that. Riding Fat. It just, again, everything just feels... Feels like it's all just following it, falling in line. Not without great strategy, lots of experience, <laughs> and lots right? Lots of stress. And lo <laughs> look how gray my hair. It's all falling out. And now you're too. speaking it's to worse. somebody else who's gray, so <laughs> not an issue. I if, and, and we're in now. That's gray right. Yeah, in. gray is in. Right. I, I dye my hair this color. It's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. People do ask me that. Yeah. They have like what is the, no the number on the box? Like what's the name? What's the brand you use? I'm like, listen, this is yeah, life. This, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just gray. Exactly. Thanks again. Thank you. You've been listening to Phoenix Business Radio X broadcasting live from within the Mac. Six Conscious Works Baked Studio. Some media leans left, some lean right, and we lean business. Until next time, I'm Karen Nowicki. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.